This is Michael Simmons, DP on Halloween, and you're listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions. This is the Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals in the video production and filmmaking industries. Michael Simmons is the director of photography for the 2018 sequel to the classic horror film Halloween. Michael and I discuss the shooting of the film, working with director David Gordon Green, the parallels between horror and comedy, and filmmaking philosophies that everyone can use. The Go Creative Show is supported by Rule Boston Camera, Newshooter.com, Hedge.video, Shutterstock.com, and PremiumBeat.com. Premium, royalty-free music and sound. Just in time for Halloween, we are covering the movie Halloween. How about that? I have been so excited about this film for like two years when they first announced that it was being done and everyone was kind of like, ooh, is it happening? Is it not? Who's going to be involved? And I've been kind of following it along the way. And once I saw the first couple of uh, the first trailer and then the second trailer that was a little bit more extended, I just got so excited because the classic original Halloween still for me and I'm a gentleman of a certain age, but still for me is the best in the franchise. And this new one takes its cues and takes its visual um, uh, inspiration from that original film. They actually completely disregard all the others. This is basically Halloween 2 in a way. It's the true real sequel that the original film should have had many, many years ago. And so excited to talk to Michael Simmons about it. We actually talk a lot about philosophies, shooting philosophies. So for those of you that may not even be interested in Halloween, it doesn't matter because this episode is about so much more. It's about how to shoot, how to approach horror, how to approach comedy, the parallels between the two, and just philosophies that we can all employ, uh, whether you're a filmmaker, or any sort of creative, it's all great stuff. And Michael's interview is coming up in just a couple of minutes. But before then, I want to talk about Rule Boston Camera. Rule is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. I do it. My money's where my mouth is because I am always there. And yes, they sponsor the show, but it's not like I get special treatment. Well, I'm going to rephrase that. I do get special treatment, but not because they sponsor the show. I get special treatment because everybody gets special treatment over at Rule Boston Camera. Here's why. First of all, they have a world-class inventory of rental gear. So anything you could possibly want is likely there. From cameras to audio, lighting, grip, lenses, everything you need, chances are it's over there at Rule Boston Camera. But when it comes down to it, it's not just about having the equipment. It's about getting the support you need to make sure that your shoot goes off without a hitch. And that's what you're going to get at Rule Boston Camera. The service there is attentive. This business is mission critical. Okay? A lot of money goes into these shoot days, and you don't want anything to go wrong. Certainly, you don't want any complication with your equipment, and that's not situation you will ever be in when you're dealing with Rule Boston Camera. They're there. They have your back. They make sure you understand the equipment when you leave. They're there to support you if you have any questions. Uh, It's like having a helping hand uh, at all times. So it's just that peace of mind that I like as a director, and I know you guys would like that as well. They've been doing this thing for over 35 years, so they certainly know what they're doing. They get a brand new building right in Boston. It's fantastic. And uh, I strongly encourage you guys to check it out. So go to rule.com, R-U-L-E.com, and take a peek. All right, without any further ado, here we go with our interview with Michael Simmons, Director of Photography for Halloween. All right, so I'm here with Michael Simmons, the Director of Photography for uh, Halloween, Really excited to have you on. I'm such a huge fan of this franchise. And I think it was like maybe two summers ago, word started getting out that this was being worked on. And I've been so excited ever since and really excited to have you here today to talk about it. Look forward to talking about it. I'd love to know how you first got involved in the project. I know you have a history with uh, Bloomhouse, um, having worked on Paranormal Activity 2 and certainly a great relationship with uh, Jason Bloom and the guys there. Um, but how did it begin for you? Well, uh, you know, uh, Paranormal Activity 2 is my first kind of studio film, and um, it was the beginning of the Blumhouse franchise. Uh, and so I got in with them really early, and I, I've always liked them and loved them and kept in touch. And um, they 
uh, we're teaming up with David Gordon Green, who I've known socially forever, and um, I shot uh, season two of Vice Principals with him. So um, when it came time to, um, you know, as Halloween was being developed, David pitched my name to shoot it. And Blumhouse said, perfect, we love Michael. So it, it was uh, an easy, easy job to get. It, 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 I, I had no idea until I started looking into you more that you had worked on Vice Principals 2 and Smilf. And I mean, a, a good, you know, th- these are some really great comedies. And uh, first of all, completely different than films because you're doing a, a, a series that's lasting many hours versus an hour and a half or two hours. But it's also comedy. And I, I'm curious from your perspective, is there any sort of comparison between doing something like Halloween, Paranormal Activity 2, clearly horror films meant to scare you, and something meant to make you laugh. I mean, horror and comedy are both timing. They're, they're completely about, you know, no, uh, pace and, and time. Um, I mean, is there different? I, I can't. Just, horror is by far the hardest genre to shoot, from my experience, because it's um, it's not as immediately as rewarding as comedy or uh, drama. So, huh. for instance, when you, when you shoot a comedy, you're, you're laughing on set. When you shoot a drama, you're, you know, um, you know, you have an emotional impact to the to the scene. But when you're shooting horror, it's very scientific. It's very editorial and difficult to tell if it works. You really don't know. Like, is this scary? Well, you know, there's 50 billion lights pointing everywhere, and there's no cameras, and you know, like, do we? Are we seeing too much? Are we seeing too little? Uh, will this jump scare work? You know, dot, dot, dot. That's, yeah, that, that's a good point. I wasn't really thinking about it in those terms, but I guess I, I, my assumption is that it's, it would be the same for comedy too, because yeah, you're laughing on set, but it's like a great joke on set could die in the edit and, you know, a great, uh, scary effect on, uh, on a horror film can also die in the edit or vice versa. I mean, an edit can work to make something better than it is too. Um, but it's funny to hear this, hear you say that. So it sounds like you're saying you, you sort of feel like something's working, uh, on a comedy set versus a horror set. I mean, my, I've got a lot of comedy. I mean, I just, uh, there's my job before Halloween, I think was, um, the Tracy Morgan TV show, the last OG. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, you know, Tracy's going to come out. He's going to be funny. <laughs> you know, it's going to work. Yeah. The, uh, and, and it could be shot on a cell phone for all you care. And perhaps the audience would even prefer if it's shot on a cell phone. Um, but with hard, the levels of light and dark and contrast and depth of field, it's really critical. Mm. It, it, and palette and shot functionality, uh, it, distribution of information, how much of the shape is too much of the shape. Uh, all this stuff is it's just like, it's not easy. I, Paranormal 2 is one of the hardest things I've ever shot. In, it's, a, you know, the simplest type of filmmaking. And why is that? Because, uh, once again, is this thing scary? I have no idea. It's a bunch of, you know, it's actually incredibly boring. You know, it's a bunch <laughs> of um, <laughs> security cameras and people talk, you know, improvising and talking nonsense. And then occasionally a minute specific detail in the background, uh, you know, adjusts and you hope the audience responds. Yeah, I think if you're, it, it's one of those things where it's like, you can always rely on jump scares. To, uh, you can always rely on making a jump scare more effective by having a loud sound or a flash or something that that gets your other senses. But something that truly scares you and makes you like sick to your stomach in fear is something that can, it's just so little. It's a little bit of something, but you also have to be drawn, you have to be lured to it over time. To, oh, to make that moment impactful. Um, I mean, we, I mean, we talked endlessly on um, Halloween about, you know, first of all, we, we approached it like, you know, like Friedkin did The Exorcist or, you know, SD, uh, great directors who made great horror films that aren't horror film directors. Mm. We studied those films, you know, because David doesn't hasn't made a horror film before. I'm not, you know, a horror guy. So we really try to find which are the exceptional movies made by non-horror our directors and lean into those. And, you know, what's the first act in a horror movie like this? Well, generally it's sort of just establishing family drama, you know, like in a Bergman sense, like who 
who resents who and who loves who and who uh, feels unloved by who. Mm. And then, and then, you know, you slowly introduce um, some suspense. And then by the end you have, you know, long sequences of violence. What were some of the other movies that you were inspired by? You, you had mentioned you wanted to pick films that were ma- horror movies made by directors that aren't horror directors. So what was on your list? I, you know, David, you know, was supposed to remake Suspiria for a long time. Oh, was, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was the script going around, and it almost happened over the last 10 years, I think. So um, Dave is always very interested in that color palette of, like, um, weird colors and stuff. And I, I know he's a Argento fan, so – and I know David personally, so I know what he likes. Yeah. And um, But to be honest, I, I, I don't come into movies with a lot of movie references. Hmm. It, it's, it's fairly irrelevant to me. The, the – um, what I like to do is sit with the director in the mornings, uh, you know, in their house or wherever, and act out the movie with them. We stand on our feet, reading the script, playing each other the roles, and talking about, um, you know, the scenes and what, 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 what information's redundant, you know, who scene is this, what are, what are some fun character twists, what are some good scares, and, and just do that for days and days and days, just act the thing out. Huh. And that's that's my, my creative process, at least. Well, it, it's interesting to hear that and, and honestly kind of refreshing. I mean, a lot of people come on this show and they have, you know, tens and tens of references that they've watched. And it, they're almost like it, it, it's 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 a good thing and a bad thing. But I think um, a lot of people have almost like a film school mentality where everything is a reference to something else. And you sometimes lose just the feeling of the moment that you're working on at that at that time. Uh and, and it's kind of cool to hear you say that that's the way that you work on your projects and worked on this project. Um, because actually, what, as I was reading some of the press material, you had been credited in your ability to be adaptable. Um, Jason Bloom had said uh, that he commented you on your adaptability and flexibility and said that it was really important to the production of this film. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that, staying flexible, planning, but also staying flexible. It seems like that's partly the way that you work. Well, it's super nice to hear that Jason said that. And um, uh, to kind of try to sum it up is like, I'm not a cinematography nerd. I'm Mm. a storytelling nerd. I'm into the distribution of information. I'm interested in creating the, um, the create amount of shots to, to evoke a certain sense, emotion or sensation, like in, in the Eisenstein film form sense, as far as like, it should look like, uh, you know, HUD. You know, I don't give a shit. <laughs> it's, it really doesn't. It's, <laughs> yeah. not how I, it's not how I work. And um, and then as far as flexibility, you know, and David and I would always talk about this. We're like, any scene you have, there's the two-day version of the scene, and then there's the one-hour version of the scene, and there's the triage one-shot version of a scene, you know? So, um, you, so sometimes I can't be flexible, but how much time a scene can take is, is is just solely based on how much time someone gives you. Hmm. And this was about a 30 day shoot. Am I right on that? Around that time? Give or take. There was, um, Blumhouse, is, I, I, you know, there's some reshoots and stuff like that. So I, I don't know how they, they add that in. I know the principal photography was less than 30 days. Hmm. It, it, was a, it was a grueling, um, 25, you know, like nights or something. It was very uh, difficult hours. Yes, that seems very compressed, especially something that's at night so much. I mean, that that sounds like a really intense schedule. Yes, and the, um, you know, I, there's no weekend. You know, you know, first of all, we're all kind of middle-aged people at this point. <laughs> this isn't being made by, you know, a 25-year-old director. <laughs> you know, kids. And um, so, you know, you go to work, you get you have a day shoot on Monday, then you slip into nights by Wednesday or Tuesday. You stay nights all week, and you get off Saturday morning at five in the morning, uh-huh. and then you show back. Then they turn you over to daytime for Monday at a five a.m. call. You understand? So you get off work at Saturday morning at five a.m. Oh and you go you, you go back. So it's your weekend is really not about you know. It's just about turning over your schedule. God almighty, that, that sounds, I do mostly commercial work here and you know, the, the longest a production would ever take is maybe like a few days of pre-production, a couple shoot days and a little bit of wrap at the end. So 
I mean, my longest schedules are like a week. <laughs> so, oh. I, I mean, per production, uh, I mean, I can't even on, imagine on, something on, like that. Yeah, I'm on a 60 day one right now, uh, feature film. And it's, um, as I say to my wife, I say, imagine watching an action film and having to memorize every single shot and analyze how they did it. And that's what it's like to shoot an action film. Oh my God. To... What are you working on? Can you tell us? Yeah, it's, um, it's a, um, Netflix movie currently titled power that stars Jamie Foxx and Joseph Gordon Levitt. And, uh, it's science fiction based, based I would say in new Orleans. You are jumping around genres. I love that. You know, you really kind of get the jobs that people call you for. So I, I'm, I'm working with the same directors I worked with on Nerve, which was a fun kind of teen thriller movie. And um, I, you know, wrapped up Halloween, had a couple of weeks off and went straight to this. What does it do to family life for someone like you that's doing these 30 day, 60 day stretches? Do you do you just move your family to wherever you're going? Well, I wish. I mean, now my son is um, seven in school and, you know, he's not as flexible. You know, he he turned one in India with me on the, the movie The Lunchbox. And I used to kind of drag them around. And a lot of it's literally flights home for, you know, one day and I fly back and they come visit. And then I you know take a, a month or two off. But as you know, you get more successful, the, it gets very difficult. Mm. And, because, and, you know, you get, you, you've established a lifestyle you kind of have to maintain. And it's true. Like you, you had mentioned, you know, you guys aren't young kids anymore doing these things. And it's like physically on the body, just that it, it, it wears more when you're middle age. And then also you just have so much, so many more people relying on you personally. Um, yeah. when you, the, when you get older, the truth is you get, you get a lot better at your job, you know, um, yeah. from, me shooting man push cart or something, you know, uh, whatever, what, 2004 to now it's, you know, I'm a completely different person. I, I, I know how to use multiple cameras. I, you know, know how many setups you really need encourage, you know, you don't do 17 takes of the same thing anymore. So now when you're working with younger directors that haven't been through as much as you have, do you like, is it generally your take to kind of help them, pull together production schedules that, that, you know, that avoid some of the mistakes that you had made earlier on, or do you just kind of follow them as they lead? I'm going to think about that for two seconds. Uh, there's certain shots that less experienced directors will always make the same mistake, such as. Yeah. I'd love to hear an example. Uh, a classic example is, um, a car landing in a position, somebody getting out and beginning performance. Hmm. Okay. Now landing a car, even for 20 feet is an ordeal. Okay. And meanwhile, is the seatbelt on? Is the seatbelt off? Uh, and how, how many times has that actor been in the car? So generally uh, it takes the actor three times longer to get out of a picture car than it would in his real car. Cause he doesn't know how to get up the seatbelt. He doesn't know how to, sh where the shifter goes. He doesn't know how to turn off the headlights. Uh. Okay. So you take, and, and I would say in the history of cinema, there's probably 20 shots of people landing a car, getting out of the car and starting to say lines. Mm. It doesn't exist. It just takes too long. And so, um, it comes to a grinding halt. The other one is getting multiple people through doorways. You know, I've seen huh. production, I've seen million dollar, you know, multi-million dollar productions come to a grinding halt. I'm trying to get four people through a door and land on natural marks. You know? <laughs> I guess it's that's like, true. You can only put so many people through a doorway. Well, because the way they land, so you see all four people, is, you know, let's say a bunch of people walk in a room and see something, you know, uh, it, you have to stagger them for the shot in, in a very illogical way. You understand? So it, it reads fine on camera when they're already there, but as you you just like, so you have the first two people already there and just the last two people land on the marks, it feels much more natural. Um, th th there's a handful of, of these shots, uh, spending, f trying to get a wide shot perfect. You know, wide shots only exist for geography. There's really not performance in them. You can't, movies are medium shots and close-ups. Hmm. That's what 90% of movie is. The, the wide shot is just atmospheric, geography and stuff like that. And, you know, you just need the, 
them to roughly hit their marks or in the violent pieces, you know, exaggerate our emotions bigger than they will in other shots. And, you know, when people's bodies move, you know, you, that's when you go to them, but um, there's no reason to do it more than twice. That that's very interesting to hear you say, because I've been on sets where uh, directors will nitpick a wide shot to the point where you've lost all your time that you, that you were going to dedicate on mediums and closes in your wide, trying to get it perfect, something that is really only going to be seen for a very short period of time relative to the rest of the piece. Uh, that, that, that happens a lot. It happens in the commercial world, so I can only imagine it happens in the, in the, in the filmmaking world. And also the, the, um, the less experienced director will obsess over detail. But a lot of it's the, the problem with these um, interviews, to be honest. These American cinematographer and in, you know, all these film magazines really um, fetishize these, like, the, the the legendary behaviors of eccentric weirdos that yeah. you know uh, took five days doing a shot you know but which is it's just made up and fabricated and and not the norm uh, a director like David Gordon Green who does this day in day out I mean he that guy directs more per year than you know anybody mm. you know uh, TV film commercials everything he um he knows what's important he knows what shots he needs um. You know, and he knows how to prioritize. I, I've, I've never seen that guy, you know, freak out over uh, the specifics of, you know, cutlery on a table. But I have many times seen directors freak out on cutlery on a table or a, a glass not re- being right or a chair not being right. When the reality is it's, it's, it's fairly irrelevant. Hmm. And, and just not – you just can't control – at a certain level, you can't control it. I feel like that stuff bogs you down too. Like I've gotten into that trap a couple times where I feel like I'm obsessing over something that really isn't even what I should be focused on. I, I should be worried about talent. I should be worried about performance and the overall feel of it. But I find myself sometimes getting into the weeds in like art direction or in just thinking about like, oh, is that the right sized vase? It's like, it doesn't matter. But sometimes you get stuck into these moments and you just can't get out of them. And it, you can drive yourself crazy. If that's your feeling, you should be the art director. Yeah. You know, exactly. I, I say that I say that about camera operating. You know, but with you know, and, and directors are very sensitive to what they say to an actor because whatever they say will get amplified by five. You know, whatever note you tell an actor, you're going to get, and you're going to get a lot of. You understand? And the same thing with like camera operators. You know, if if the if the headroom's slightly incorrect, and I tell them to correct it, they're going to overcorrect it. Mm. You understand? So. A lot of it is, is just giving into the machine of the filmmaking. And, I, you know, it, this is, I've always talked about this. As the films get bigger and bigger, you have to trust the machine. You have to trust the the, the trucks and the small army of people you bring. Hmm. What's your feeling on communicating with the talent as a director of photography? That's a very good question. Um, I, I try not to communicate directly. Hmm. Um, I... I'm very into nonviolent communication, meaning, you know, uh, I, pr- I always approach my communication with the, I'll start with how do I communicate with the director, which is, uh, you know, I make suggestions. I ask, would you like to hear another option? Um, are, are, do you feel passionate about your decision? Would you like to, you know, converse about other opportunities? You know, if, if you go into these conversations with, I have a great idea, yours is not great, which is what 99999% of people do, you will lose the argument because mm. you are beginning from a place of hostility. So you got to find a way to, one, bring in your input at the appropriate moment because there's no reason to uh, give a dialogue note, you know, during pre-production. You know, it's, it's, it's so irrelevant, you know. And then um, on the uh, – but then when it comes to talking to the talent, you know – I, I really kind of try to stay out of it. I, I have a friendly relationship with people and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, if they're in earshot distance of the director, they hear what I'm saying. But, um, and if, if, if they, you know, the light looks nicer, if they lean in, I might, I might make that suggestion. But otherwise, I, I kind of try to adjust to them. I loved your list of questions just a couple minutes ago. Like those were, those were fantastic ways of offering the possibility of you providing another, you know, some input. Like it, it was even different than saying like, you know, I think we should do this, or I think we should try this. It wasn't even that. It, it was 
I, I almost want to hear that again. <laughs> those, those were such really great. It was such a great way of saying, I have an idea I'd like to share, but are you willing to accept new ideas right now? Like, I loved that. I mean, I, as, as a DP, I have, you know, I, I don't envision a scene. I have five ways of envisioning a scene. Mm. Uh, you know, like I've, I, I have more ideas than anyone can handle. Directors have a specific idea in their head yeah. going into something. And this is a little antidote, but once on Vice Principals, I was pitching David something. And David, who's a very honest guy and very close friend of mine, David goes, Mike, for five seconds, will you just let me say my thoughts first? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I'm a person that I will always blame myself and you know think, how can I make myself better? And I said to myself, my gosh, he's completely right. He's completely right. You know, and so now I uh, I approach my collaborations, which first of all, what are you thinking? <laughs> would you uh, like to have a, would you like to discuss other possibilities? Um, do you feel passionate about this? And uh, yada, 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 you know, and it should, like the, even the word I think is a hostile way to phrase something. Yeah, it is. In, in, a, in a collaboration. It's ultimately not your say. Backing up media is the single most important thing that you can do on your shoots. And not just backing it up once, no. And not just dragging a file from the finder willy-nilly, no. It's about doing it professionally. It's about doing it quickly, reliably. All you got to do is go to hedge.video. That's it. Hedge is it. Hedge is the backup software for filmmakers. It's super easy to use. It's also super fast. You can keep track of everything with transfer logs. You can import multiple sources and send it to multiple destinations. So never again will you're going to leave set with just one backup of something. That's, a, that's an insane thing to do. So you shouldn't be doing that. But it's going to be so much easier now to have multiple backups. When I do my backups <clears throat> on shoots where I'm doing my own DIT work, I have a couple camera cards. I got my audio card. I get everything going. Sometimes a photographer will take some behind the scenes footage, throw it all into hedge, throw it all onto multiple uh, destinations, a couple of backup hard drives I carry with me all the time. It's done. It's done fast. It's done reliably. And when the transfer is done, I get a notification on my phone. So I could be sitting there having a very relaxing lunch between shoots and I get a notification on my phone that everything is done. And I know it's going to be fast. I know it's going to be accurate. And I know that all of my destinations have been backed up the way I want them to. Hedge.video forward slash go creative show is where to go. You get 20% off the full price, but there's all sorts of licensing options available, including a free tier. So I strongly encourage you to check it out. You are going to love this software. Hedge.video forward slash go creative show. I know you do a lot of commercial work too. And if your experience is, is like mine, uh, you may agree with this, but I often find that the people from the ad agency, creative directors at the ad agency are generally much more in control than directors and producers that are brought in to make that vision like a reality. Like it seems like it, the driver is generally the creative directors, even when you have like a, a larger name director on something. At least that's what I've seen in my experience. Uh, it, it, I don't know if you agree with that or, or if it's the same at the level of work that you're doing, but on the film set, do you feel like the director is still maintaining um, their vision throughout? Are, are they kind of the, or even, or even compared to a TV show with a showrunner, where a showrunner would sort of have almost more of a say sometimes than a director, especially directors that come on on, on a single episode basis. How does that compare in the film world? First thing, I, I, I'm not a high end commercial guy. I, you know, I get a handful of these things a year, and you know, uh, and uh, I don't really truly understand the power structure of how they work. There's, you know, the ad agency and the production agency, and sure. the director. And, and but you have to, the what, one thing you have to go into knowing is these ad agency people, the small army of you know very young people that you know, their their market has shifted dramatically. So they're often very young. They, they're not super high paid. And uh, they've been working on this thing for a year yeah. on this one concept of, you know, a, 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 of like, a, you know, of a specific, specific sandwich for a fast food company, you know? So 
the the way the toast marks and the you know the how much cilantro is shown and this is so important to these people and the more you respect that and honor that the better time you're going to have on a commercial mm. you know if yeah. you go and then as, and it's the director's job to facilitate the you know this product that they're showing and i have found that you could either go into this world saying um hey these dumb idiots don't know what they're doing or you could say Ooh, I'm going to double down and care even more about the grill marks and the amount of cilantro on the sandwich than they do. Yeah. You know, and if you, if you lean into the problem, you'll win. If you fight the problem, you'll have a miserable time. So then on commercial, on TV shows, I've, you know, most of the shows I've done, the, the showrunner is like, you know, Danny McBride or something like that. So th- that's an easy problem. But the, uh, on last OG, you know, there's showrunners and different directors coming in and, um, the, the directing job is they have a vision, but it's much more limited because they have to, the content's only like 22 minutes long Yeah, you know, for a TBS show, a movie like Halloween, David and I could literally do whatever we want as long as we, you know, more or less made our days and created good content. Mm. You know, there was, there was no, I mean, on big shows you have to uh, get, I mean, big movies, they want approval on the shoe wear on like this 20th person on the call sheet. I mean, literally it it gets so micromanaged, uh, that, you know, you have to advocate for, um, you know, what, what socks somebody's wearing literally, you know, the, the directors do. Uh, And David is, um, in a position of power and specifically on Halloween because the way Blumhouse works, which is, Hey, just do a good job. Keep it on budget, you know, more or less. Let's talk about Halloween. Um, Obviously, you're jumping into a franchise that has been well-established. I I can only assume you are a fan of the original and maybe even some uh, throughout the past 40 years or 20 years, however long it's been going on. Um, We're just coming off of, I think the last set of Halloweens were the Rob Zombie ones. Am I right Mm -hmm. on that? I think so. Which took a very different direction and took the franchise into a really... um, it changed kind of the way that the Halloween franchise felt when you watched it. I personally liked those. I thought they were kind of cool, but I've been a fan of the franchise, so I'm, I'm biased. Um, when you're coming into this now, knowing that this is truly a reboot, it's a continuation of the first one, the original. How are you planning for that from your standpoint as a cinematographer? Well, I mean, I'm going to start this off about talking about Paranormal 2, because so this is a movie, Paranormal One, that comes out. That comes out of nowhere. Yeah, it's, it becomes this massive hit, and then we're now uh, me and this guy Kip Williams, the director, uh, get somehow bizarrely get hired to make this little movie in you know Los Angeles, and we're like we had no idea what the hell we were doing. We're like, is this horrible? <laughs> you know, we were like, is this going to be like Blair Witch Two, which was like the worst sequel of all time? It, it you know, really famous, was. <laughs> yeah, famous, we're like uh, you know like. And then what we realized on Paranormal 2 is, hey, we have to view this as a comic book series where, like, the next episode's not that different from the first one. You know, you're just sort of, like, retelling the first, you know, continuing the story or retelling the story a little bit. And um, it turned, it worked out. People liked that film. And it kind of, you know, created the fran- continued the franchise, and they made a gazillion more of those movies. So when you go, go into a movie like Halloween, uh, once again, you're just like... Do, let's do not Blair Witch to this thing. Let's, you know, let's uh, figure out what worked in Halloween one and continue what worked in Halloween one. And um, one of the first things I did was I called up um, Dean Cundy, the original DP, who's a you know, legend, Back to the Future, and I mean, like he basically every movie you, you love, he shot. Yeah. And um, we talked about you know philosophies and cinematography and about shot progression and you know making shots functional rather than stylistic and you know he would talk about things he can't stand these days you know like short focus you know wide lens shots with diopters which is very popular he's just like tell the story of you know the feet tell the story you know make the shot functional in the the, the building blocks of the scene Mm. and um which is kind of how i work anyway but uh yeah and i always stuck to that don't don't make it trendy don't you know just follow somebody for no reason. Mm. That was his specific thing. He was like, 
you can't just follow. I mean, like, I, I, we kind of do, but just don't follow somebody endlessly on a steady cam. He's like, you, you've got to tell the story of the knife. You got to tell the story of, you know, the suspense as you're doing it. It's not just a shot. And it's interesting to hear you say that that's part of the advice he gave you, because I mean, that, that, I, I'm not sure if these are opening shot or one of the very early shots in the first Halloween was that kind of steady cam shot. I mean, I think it was an actual steady cam, the Panaglide, um, in that, in that walking shot where, um, uh, we're going through the neighborhood in the original Halloween, it's a long shot. You know, it, there's not a lot of cuts in that film. And, uh, it's interesting to hear that that's sort of been his philosophy since then and continues on now. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean you can take the exact same thing he's saying with back to the future, which is like, you know, how they film the diner or whatever. You know, I don't want to go too into that cause it'd get too heady, but sure. like, um, the, the original Halloween movie, which I'm a fan of, you know, I'm, I'm not a horror guy. I'm a cine, I'm a cinephile. You know, yeah. I'm not, and to me, the, the first Halloween is, it's practically an art film. It's, it's sort of just like uh shot reverse shot, you know, like, Hey, do you see that guy over there? And then you cut to the guy over there and then the woman turns her head and you cut back and he's gone, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and then you shift perspectives to where the shape was. And then you, you see the girls walking away and it's really like, the science of hard cuts and big jumps and perspective shifts. Like that's what Halloween is <laughs> that, you know, of course, Halloween is Michael Myers, but um, it's not like when you break down, what is a franchise, you know, what is paranormal? Paranormal is handy cam security cam like a ha- in a house. Yeah. It has to be that or else it's not a, a paranormal. That's why Blair Witch 2 fails. Cause what's Blair Witch? Well, Blair Witch is a handheld movie, you know, a documentary. Found footage, yeah. yeah. And, and, and they left that, uh, to make something else. And that's not Blair Witch. It's, you know, it's book of shadows. So with Halloween, we try to, you know, analyze what is Halloween. Halloween is, uh, jumps of perspective playing with Michael Myers in the frame, you know, his, his POV, the people not seeing him, yada, yada, yada. So, um, I try to honor that, which is what the first one is. The, audience wouldn't um handle the pace of the first one today there's no way i mean yeah. people people think they want it you know and and we shoot stuff like that but it they they need more cuts it's just not the way movies are are digested anymore yeah T- tastes have changed yes i think the attention span has shortened the acceptance of a long shot has shortened but it still is longer relative to what is commonly seen nowadays and i feel like that's something that you guys were staying true to oh 100 percent. i mean we tried to like ramp up the pace of our halloween 10 percent more than the original you know yeah. it's a, something that just kind of made it palatable but uh not we did not want to um reinvent the wheel on this one which is kind of really what happened you know I don't, bl- I don't blame them because, uh, with, you know, the, the Halloween timeline is extremely convoluted. They, it takes two different journeys. Like there's, there's ones that are, he's the sister and then there's ones that are not. And then there's uh number three, which doesn't have Michael Myers in it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's a, it, it's because John Carpenter doesn't own the intellectual property. It wasn't his, you know? So, um, we were trying to bring back what's Halloween make a sequel to it. And it seems like John Carpenter was involved heavily in this one um, as executive producers, what his title is. But it seems like even reading more about it, that he was that um, uh, you guys, uh, David Gordon Green kind of wanted his blessing almost for the direction that this went in. I, I, w- I would assume David Gordon Green, who's a genius, insisted on his blessing yeah. for this. Yeah. And I, I bet you that was part of the, part of the, um, the deal. But the, um, you know, I... I this is one thing that people often don't understand, which is uh, I'm just a cinematographer, meaning, you know, I come in, I work with the director, I figure out the shots, I figure out where the lights go, you know, participate with the cameras and the art department, the logistics of filming, and then I leave. And then I don't see anybody again <laughs> until I color correct, which I show up for, you know, 25% of if I'm lucky because I'm usually busy. And then um, I get invited to a premiere that I can't make. <laughs> so that, and then I, then I go, well, I buy a ticket to the movie and watch it just like anybody else. And then, um, I, sometimes I'll see it, you know, in a target and buy the DVD. That's literally my relationship to, to, to what I shoot. So the idea of like me knowing every minute detail of Carpenter's involvement and stuff, I know he was on set one day, you know, I know, um, you know, <laughs> but I, I think, uh, 
he was involved in the music and um, seemed like a very nice guy, but I, I, can't, I can't speak for a lot of that kind of stuff. I want to talk about your work with production designer, Richard A. Wright. Um, I, I was reading in some of the production notes that obviously the inspiration comes from the first Halloween, but time has passed. It's 40 years later now. So when you were location scouting, you were looking for textures that are a little bit older, aged environments. Um, I think some of the words that that he had said were like saltier, um, you know, more textured. Uh, and I'd love to hear from your perspective, because I know you guys were scouting quite a bit before you started shooting. And um, I'd love to get some of your insight into how the locations were picked and why. I cannot speak more highly of Richard Wright, by the way. Uh, Richard Wright's been working with David Gordon Green since George Washington. Uh, there might be a movie or two that he uh, didn't participate in. And David Green's gang, and I know David for 10 years at least, you know, and I did work with him before in commercials, vice principals. I'm the new guy. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I know this guy, you know, I've had sleepovers with David and I'm still the new guy. Richard goes back, you know, since they were teenagers. Wow. Uh, and there's other people on the crew like that too. So, um, Richard really steers the ship in locations, you know? So when I get down there, their location manager, Scott Clackham, um, who's also a producer, went to school with them too. So you're talking about people that know each other like brothers. So Scott Clackham and Richard really, um, you know, already had a, a lot of input and, and a lot of movies is, is logistics. You know, you're looking for, you know, these nice words and poetry, but a lot of it's like, where can we blow something up at night? You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, um, the, uh, I, for some bizarre reason, they brought me down extremely early in the prep. So I was there on the first scouts, which generally I'm not. Normally they kind of pick them out. And um, a lot of fun things we found, like the mental hospital. Like Richard brought us there for um, the school set. But then we looked out at this checkerboard thing and – we just, I, I always use the word jam. Let's just jam ideas. And Richard, let's jam this. Like, wouldn't it be fun if Michael was out there? You know, because the script said in a seedy, dark, you know, a dungeon of a place, you know, like, like um, Silence of the Lambs. And we just weren't finding that. And then we were like, let's just make it surreal and weird. Like, what if Michael was in the middle of the checkerboard? You know, so we um, sometimes just lean into the mistakes. I was going to ask you about that because I, I just watching into the trailer, I never in a million years would have thought that was an actual location that looked that way. It just seemed too perfect. Um, but the more I read that it was something you actually found I mean, that's amazing. I mean, what an odd, weird, uh, environment. It was just perfect. It was perfect. But, but the, this is another one of these, uh, you know, myths of the, of the film magazines and stuff, which I, I'm always trying to debunk, which is get rid of the word vision and replace it with your assumption. Mm. Okay. So, Often, you know, people, they, they interchange these words, which are, um, you really just assumed it was going to be that. You didn't envision it, you know? Yeah. And an assumption is the weakest form of a creative choice. Uh, so as I work with the directors and production designers, and, and I'm at what I call jamming with them, I say, let's just pretend there's a gun to our head. Let's say we have to shoot it here. And often that's where the really awesome creative decisions come from. Hmm. Yeah, you have, they, no, yeah. You have no choice. You, there's a there's an actor outside. There's a camera. There's a truck. You have five hours here. What do you do? And um, and sometimes that com that ten minute conversation creates the most amazing things. And other times it says it doesn't work. But I'm happy we had it. I want to talk about kind of the way you approached Michael Myers as the character in here because he's certainly supernatural in some ways, but. He's also grounded because, you know, his appearance is just a guy walking around. Uh, and you have to make that scary. You have to make that imposing. When it, Yes, the mask is scary. But sometimes you don't even see that. You just see the frame of a person walking. How are you approaching that to make him clearly appear different than any other person in the, in the film, but also not just a person, but somebody that is imposing and menacing and scary? I think one way was put him in the middle of a checker field. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because what other con, you know, you know, his back's going to be to camera. You know, you're, you're, you're just going to be able to make it out. You know, maybe I can get away with 
is massively out of focus. I, the broad strokes is you can't see Michael's face until the mask gets put on. Of course. I mean, it's, the, it's the rule of the people. We explored these avenues in, in going over the script, which is don't go into Michael's backstory. The second you go into Michael's backstory, the audience, it's like, um, pulling away and revealing the wizard of Oz. You've just destroyed the, the illusion, yeah. you know, it, th- th- this is a magic trick. What is Halloween? What is the franchise? It's about a boogeyman that's written as the shape that, you know, appears and reappears. He doesn't fly, <laughs> you know, it's crowded in some reality. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, he seems to like to leave bodies hidden in creative ways. You know, that's another thing you, when you analyze the movie, you're like, why well, Michael kills people and he kind of hides them, but he kind of, you know, has created semi art projects with them. <laughs> but you, you know, when you really analyze it and you think about it, so uh, that, that's what we try to lean into. Um, and of course, there's just the technicality of, you know, making a suspenseful frame without seeing him too much and just seeing the evidence of him and, you know, dot, 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 and how, you know, how far is too far and how dumb is too, you know, did we cover his face too much with a branch at the cemetery or not enough? You know, you're again, a little variation, some lens choices to make the decision later, but you know, you know, you can't get too close to the dude. Can you, can you point out maybe a, a scenario where you made an artistic choice in your lensing or your camera to uh, help support making Michael look as scary or as, you know, uh, menacing as possible? I, I mean, my favorite scene, well, you, you, you have to understand, I haven't really fully seen the movie in the theater. Sure. Wait, wait, uh, how to make him, you know, hmm, let me think about what you're saying. Because, you know, I've always been assuming you're talking about him unmasked. Because unmasked Michael is a much harder story to tell than masked Michael. Sure. You know, the second you put masked Michael on, yeah, it's just about lighting and not putting too much face, you know, light on the face. But unmasked Michael is a, F and challenge, which is, um, and I think we rocked it on that checkerboard, you know, dungeon thing where you, it's, you have a scene that's just about a guy holding up a mask to the, to somebody else's back and yelling, say something as extras are jumping up and down. Yeah. And it's absolutely horrifying and completely suspenseful. And I've seen it at test audiences, it gets them completely pumped up and it's pure cinema. It's pure, you know, the correct shots, the sh- you know, the, the, the yellow line as the foot walks toward it, you know, the, the, the push in on the back of Michael, you know, with the typed focus on his neck, you know, seeing a bit of the dead eyeball, you know, uh, that, that scene we really won. Um, mm-hmm. Once he puts the mask on, life gets a lot easier. Mm. It, you, you just don't want to put too much light on the mask. But I mean, the mask work was amazing. I mean, we had the, the best guy in the business created the thing and it was treated like, you know, uh, the Holy Grail when it was on set. You are listening to the premiumbeat.com song of the week. It's called Walls of Jericho by Wolves. PremiumBeat.com is where to go for all of your royalty-free music and sound effects. If you go to PremiumBeat.com, you can get access to a collection of thousands of royalty-free tracks. Thousands! For as low as 49 bucks each. And here's the best thing. You don't just get the single track, like many other websites. You get cutdowns. You get loop sets. You get all the assets you need so that you can customize the track perfectly to your project. But the most important thing is quality, and that's what you're going to find at premiumbeat.com. So head over there, premiumbeat.com, check out their uh, their selection there, throw it into your projects, play with it a little bit, and I know you're going to love it. Check it out, premiumbeat.com. And lastly, let's talk about shutterstock.com. Shutterstock has over 8 million royalty-free video clips, and many of them are in 4K. Just this week, there's been over 70,000 clips added. So it's just, it's an endless, endless supply of footage that just keeps being put on there. And the thing is, it's not, it's not, you know, quantity over quality. It's quality. It's quality and quantity, which is kind of insane. But that's what you get at Shutterstock.com. 
It has super easy pricing, so you can always fit it into your budget perfectly. And if you want to save some money, which why wouldn't you, you can buy video packs, and that allows you to prepay for a selection of downloads, and you end up saving a lot. I mean, you can save hundreds of dollars when you do this video pack, and that's what I tend to do all the time. But I also go there for inspiration. Sometimes I just go to Shutterstock.com, click on the footage tab, and I just look around because the clips they have are so well curated and put into these categories that are so interesting and new and changing all the time that I just go there for inspiration. I certainly use their footage for much more than just my own projects. I use their footage in their photography sometimes to just create director treatments to just explain to other people what my vision is. So there's so much more to do at Shutterstock.com than simply just look for stock footage. It's to look for inspiration. So head over there, Shutterstock.com. Check out what they have. You'll love it. I know you will. What, um, what camera package did you ultimately choose for this? What did you shoot on? This movie was shot on uh, Aerie Alexas, a couple of the two studio modes, and I probably had a mini somewhere. And it was, I think I used Cook anamorphic lenses. And uh, part I mean, that's another thing. Halloween has to be anamorphic. That, that's, that's another conversation Dean Kundi and I had. But um, I went with Cook anamorphics because uh, they're much more reasonable. Meaning, anamorphic lenses are like wine. I mean, they're very subtle and very. There's tons of different types, and even from bottle to bottle of the same brand, it changes. Mm. You know, so like set of a specific, you know, Panavision E series in LA is feels differently than the one in New York, you know? So cooks are way more standardized. And I knew I was gonna have to be shooting multi-camera scenes. So I needed a more standardized, flatter anamorphic. You know, like kind of behave more spherically. And um then we had uh many zooms. We began with um anamorphic zooms are very hard to come by. And you it, anamorphic it's not like uh going to, to b h photo or you know it's, there's not millions of these things there's yeah. a minute set i mean the movie i'm on right now like we have the only 125 millimeter in the world of this new lens set that i'm using so wow. uh, it's just very specialized and um i began with um spherical zooms that they put anamorphic adapters on and they I didn't really get what I wanted and um, because it, it lacked that um, anamorphic fun, you know, the, fl the flaring and the, the bendy frame. But they were very useful because that opening zoom shot and the checkerboard thing was done with a very long spherical zoom with an anamorphic adapter. But by the end of the show, I was able to get a Cook uh, anamorphic zoom that was, you know, they just got them released. And um, I was super happy with that. And for lighting, I mean, it seems like you needed to move relatively quickly. I mean, you're shooting multi-camera. You have a pretty compressed schedule. Um, what were your strategies for lighting uh, in this? And I know Halloween sort of has, it, 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 it's sort of rooted in a very natural look to begin with. Um, how did you support that in the lighting? You know, I've never, maybe so a fault of mine, but I'm, I'm never uh, very poetic about how I talk about lighting, which is um, lighting first begins with where can I put the lights? Where can I hide the lights that are not in the frame? Hmm. <laughs> so, you know, it's very uh, functional, you know, as they say. And I, mean, I, I don't, I like super instinctually, you know, I, I look at a, a shot in a, in a direction and I think, you know, where the dominant source is, where's the passive source and what colors would be fun here. And I, I really shoot from the hip when it comes to lighting. I, I, I don't come in with reference boards. I don't come in. I, I never have. I, I, I never really talk about it. To me. I, I only talk about it when studio execs kind of make me and, you know, I kind of like make a fun little empowering speech that I, you know, type up and think about, but I, I, I don't. <laughs> Your book you know, report. Like, my book report, literally, but I, I don't view – it's it's a functional art form. And this is something that like – the fundamental difference between photography and cinematography is that cinematography is, fu is functional at its core. Each shot is functional. It tells a certain story. Man going through door, you know, uh, getting kids over fence, you know, uh, indecent proposal kiss. 
uh, a woman walking away um, angry, wide shot establishing a lonely boy with you know security lights turning on him, revealing Michael in the back. You know, they, they're just building blocks. They're not Diane Arbus pieces. They're not you know um, William Eggleston photos. The, the cinema does not have the uh, at least commercial cinema does not have the opportunity um, to show those, have that expression of um, beauty that photography does. One thing that I found that was interesting in uh, the night scenes, um, and obviously the film isn't out yet as we're speaking, but I, I got quite a bit of stills and a lot of, um, uh, a lot of footage from the studio. Um, you, there's a lot of color in the night scenes where all of the houses have little pops of certainly there's like this warm orange color that's coming from, from the homes. Then there's also these uh, pops of kind of interesting colors. There'll, there'll be like a green or a purple or a red or something that really catches your eye as you're walking through. And you don't need to rely on the typical kind of cool blue moonlight to light your exteriors. It's sort of like you're, you're allowed to keep your exteriors really warm. And I thought that was, uh, it was a unique way of imagining those scenes. And I think very true to the original. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just probably like the way I kind of grew up in cinematography, which is moonlight kind of got out of fashion. Yeah. Maybe we'll come back. I don't know. Uh, the um, So I think the only time I kind of like went moonlight is uh, when the bus, the bus scene, when the bus is uh, like the mental patients escape. Yeah. And, uh, but when there's a lot of new lighting scenes, Lighting has gotten very LED heavy. Yeah, which um, I so I used to be, you know, more, you know, uh, try to be old school and all that stuff like that. And sometimes I am, but that, it's very uh, easy to change the colors of the lights nowadays. Meaning, um, we there's an LRX lighting system we'd have for um, you, you put these robotic lights up in the lift. You used to have to put and they. They could pan and, and tilt, and then you have the whole the, the condor as an arm that adjusts. And then these things with some kid on the set who's got an iPad basically changes the color mm. and intensity on the on the ground. So it's you used to have to make major bold decisions, like you know I need all these you know twenty Ks you know with super white flame or you know choose whatever gel you want to put on and make that commitment, and then. You couldn't change it. Now, now you'd be like, add more green. And then it's literally somebody on an iPad. It's, it's much easier. So you had a lot of flexibility there and you could, you could play with it. But it's also appropriate to the scene too. I mean, it's Halloween. You know, people have interesting colors coming out. There. You know, they decorate their homes. I, you know, once again, this guy, Scott Clackham, is MVP on this movie, producer and locations dude. Uh, he um, really plays ball and gets access to these neighboring houses. You know, if you don't, the locations guys, if if they can't get access to people's houses that are in the background, they can't. You can't get lights in them. Yeah. So, uh, um, with the gaffer um, Bob, we were able to uh, get access to a lot of stuff. And Charles, we shot in Charleston, and they're still kind of new to filmmaking, and like you know, encourage us being there and are willing to play ball and get lights where I might not be able to get them when I'm shooting in New York. Hmm. Yeah, I mean the the locations look really really cool. Um, I didn't know where it was shot till I got the prep materials, but, uh, how was your experience shooting in Charleston? Well, that's a whole nother conversation, which is, um, Halloween takes place in Chicago, but Chicago in Halloween is actually like some LA neighborhood, like Glendale or something. Um, the Halloween fans will kill me for, that, for getting it wrong, but the, um, so there, there's like, you want, <laughs> you want your location to look like. Halloween 1978's version of Chicago, which is really a 70s version of an L.A. suburb. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, yeah. Just, just like the timeline of Halloween, the, like, it's so convoluted. So um, the locations are very dictated by like what looks like shit in the original Halloween. You know, and, and I mean, it's tricky because, you know, uh, Charleston doesn't have uh, curbs, you know, like the the the, the the property just gradiates into the, the street, mm. unlike, you know, uh, Los Angeles or Chicago. So, you, you know, little things like that, we're kind of trying to avoid, and you know, pa palm meadows and all that stuff like that. We're like, well, oh, I think we got less palm trees in our Halloween than they got in the first one. So we're okay. 
I love that. It, you know, the the more we talk, what I hear a lot from you is this idea of functionality and this kind of organic approach. It seems like almost every question I have is almost answered by sort of, you know, what what were what was available to us at that moment and making things work and and that flexibility there. And it, it almost brings me back to one of the first things I said in the first things I read is your ability to be adaptable. It seems like that is just your style. This is you and and you make work the the situations that you have available to you. It, it's well, it's really cool. I I I I was once filming uh, on Nerve. We were filming a location, and it was a perfect location, but it had a had a giant pole in the middle of the room. <laughs> and it's cinematography and giant poles and pillars and stuff like that are the enemy because. <laughs> Editorially, they, they they jump around the frame. Like you, you can't cheat space because the audience knows where the pole is. Yeah, you're, you're just like every single shot. You're basically taking apart a house to get the next shot. You understand? Like it's a where a couch is in a movie is is irrelevant. It's floating all over the the space. Yeah. You understand? Like like uh, at least that's the way I work. I I don't just go in. I I'm, I move everything. So uh, for every single shot. Yeah. So poles are extreme problems, and um. I was t- and Rel, the director, of Ner- when the directors of Nerve was like, "Let's just lean into it. Let's just make the scene about the pole. You know, let's lean on it. Like, because like, let's let's approach this pole like it's Steven Tyler's microphone. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and and this was one of these like lid blowing things in my creative life where I'm like, you know what? Analyze a- analyze the situation, figure out what the problem is, decide if it is a problem, and then decide." should the problem become the solution or is the problem an actual problem? And often it like, whether it's a, you know, an awkward piece of dialogue or an awkward set piece or something, leaning into it can be a lot more fun than trying to avoid it. Mm. You know, like what, what's more fun embracing this pole and making Steven Tyler's microphone and having the actors touch it and move around it or making the entire day about avoiding the pole. You know, the first one is obviously more interesting and challenging and fun. And every day should be interesting and challenging and fun and not feel like a fire drill. And that's my one thing that I'm constantly trying to avoid, which is making, you know, making my life feel like a fire drill. Everybody, you know, get get out of here. No, get back in the van, you know. (laughs) I love that. That that is a good philosophy that I think can carry across anything that people in our audience are doing, anything that people are doing in the whole world. It's, it's a unique perspective and, uh, and I like it and I appreciate you coming on the show to share it. Um, all right. We just got a couple minutes left when people are watching Halloween. And I know that many, many, many people will be watching this movie when it comes out. Is there something that we should be paying attention to that we should look at, uh, that, that you can give us a little bit of behind the scenes information on? Is there a scene or a, a camera movement or something that people can pick up on as they're watching that and, and get a little insight from you as to how that was made or a little behind the scenes uh, story that may not get out in the press? Something juicy and interesting. <laughs> Let me think for a couple of minutes. I mean, I just, you know, when we shoot this, when we were making this movie, we'd be like, does this work? And then we'd start listening to the music on the set. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Just go on, and we're like, fuck yeah, this works. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, and that was the ultimate indicator. And, you know, Danny McBride, David will be there. We're like, we have something. But um, I just want the audience to, you know, have the same experiences I had in the movies, you know, growing up in Westchester, New York and going to Yonkers and, you know, watching you know, a, mall, a classic mall movie, which is, you know, go bring your friends, get pumped and, you know. I think we made something really good. I really do. I, I think um, we put our, we left our blood on the floor on this one. And um, we, tra- we stayed true to it. You know, it was super collaborative. I, fun stories. It's just, you know, it's a fun story, which is, there's a sequence in this movie. We're all just sitting there t- uh, in, in David's office, me, the AD, Clackham, the producer and locations guy, and, and uh, David's assistant, and, we're talking about what should happen in that bathroom sequence. Hmm. And Clackham just walks in the room, checking his LaCroix La, La, La soda thing that he always has. And he goes, uh, hey, wouldn't it be cool if uh, <laughs> Michael just puts his hand over the um, 
that bathroom door and like it opens up and it's just like teeth falling and then you find out later it's the teeth from the gas station attendant you know yeah and and, and then the girl in the bathroom stall looks down and sees teeth and um david's like yeah badass make sure there's some teeth there you know? <laughs> and then, i mean that's how the fucking thing gets formed it's not like that's how genius is made it's made by you know friends making uh you know non-threatening suggestions that win you know and then david is just the filter of information he's like i like that idea you know and i mean another ju- I mean, I don't know how juicy of a detail it is, but like the, the where the end originally took place was not there in, in the script. It was in a different house, and um, it was uh, logistically it became impossible to shoot that as that many nights. There. I won't go too into details because I don't want to ruin the film. Sure, people, yeah, yeah, yeah. It did not end in Laurie Strode's house. It ended in the house. Okay. And, oh my God! The um, the the, uh, the it, it got cut off. Skype was cutting us off at that very moment. You said it did not end in Laurie's house. What were you saying? Oh, uh, the it had the location of the ending was somewhere different, and due to a very technical logistical reason, we could not film that many nights at the original spot. And so for days, we just were jamming in David's office, like. How the hell do we do we build this 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 on a studio? What is it green screen? How do we make this end happen? And David's um, assistant said, "Why not make it end at Laurie Strode's house?" And then we all shut up and go, "Now that's a good idea." Oh, then, I love that. And then for you know two weeks or whatever with Richard Wright, we're redesigning. We're like, okay, now um, for all I know, that's probably where that trap door idea came from. You know, I mean, I, I don't even. Maybe that's in the script. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But it's it's all about these like g- creative suggestions, creative solutions. David being the filter of all information, where uh, good ideas and the genius of hopefully the final project really lie. It sounds like it's just all about being open to two ideas. It <laughs> seems like that's kind of where you're at in your career with all the projects you work on, and certainly this. That's it's a great philosophy. It really is. Yeah, yeah that's what I, I always say. Which is and um. Maybe I've hit on this too much, but like, there's nothing threatening about an idea. There's only the the delivery of the idea that can be threatening. Yeah, you know, and that's why, like, I like to work with directors where, like, you can say, "Hey, what why, what what happens if maybe some aliens should land in this scene?" You know, like, at least you want to know, like, can we have a conversation about it? You know, it doesn't mean it's going to happen. It just means um, let's explore. Well, it has been such a pleasure talking to you, and I cannot wait to see the film. And uh, we have to have you back for your next project. I, I mean, it, you, it's it's very exciting for me to talk about the philosophies of cinematography and filmmaking versus the technical. And um, you're just fantastic at doing that. And I, I, it's it's exciting for me to have conversations like this. And I know our audience will love it. So thank you so much. No problem. Pleasure talking to you. Where can people go to find out more about you? I have a website that called Michael A. Simmons DP.com that I, that I, um, resent that I have to keep it updated. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I also, and I have a blog on it. That's a, it's basically a comedy blog about me hating to have to operate this website. I find it, the whole social media self-promotion thing, very creepy. And I hope it comes to an end very soon. <laughs> I don't I mean, think it will, but I, 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 I can only agree with you, but I don't think it will. <laughs> oh, the, the idea that like a man in mid forties that has a career has to constantly be like Michael Simmons, you know, bio and like pretend I don't exist. You know, like I'm not writing it. It's too weird. <laughs> Michael A. Simmons, yeah. DP.com. If nothing else, go there just to annoy him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Leave, leave some comments, <laughs> bring up his traffic. So he has to maintain it. That's the, if you don't like Michael Simmons, that's the perfect way to get back at him. <laughs> yeah. Thank well, you. En- enjoy. Thank you so much, Michael, for being on. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot, bud. Here he goes, Michael Simmons. So happy to have him on the show. I can't wait to see this film. Going to be first in line, I think. It's scary. I like scary movies. I want to thank our sponsors. Rule Boston Camera, Newsshooter.com, Hedge.video, Shutterstock.com, and PremiumBeat.com. They've been supporters for a long time, and we love them. I also want to thank Matt Russell, 
Matt's the one that makes the show sound so good. He mixes it. He masters it. He does it all. And he's from Gain Structure Sounds. And you can hire him to make your stuff sound good, too. He's over at GainStructure.com. You can find him on Twitter, at GainStructure. You can also find us on Twitter, Go Creative Show, at Go Creative Show. Let us know what you think of the show. If you have any guest suggestions, that'll be fun, too. Of course, you can go to our site and see all the things going on. We've got some big ones coming up, guys. Bohemian Rhapsody, Ozark. It's going to be a fun one. See you guys next time. <laughs>